Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Good morning. How are you? Morning. Y'all glad to be here? Woo. I was looking at this screen in the back. Y'all may not know that there's a screen back there. They put a time up there. Um, I saw Joe's sermon after last week, and uh, I guess that's why they put that up there. Like, don't do that again. Uh, so I can't wait till he's here to, to in the next service. We're going to have more fun with that uh, on that because they give me grief sometime and I get to give grief back uh, on that hour and 20 minutes last week. That was so good. Now there's a clock up there. There was a timer telling me exactly how long we were going. I guess they lost that. Anyway, hey, it's good to be home. Thank you for letting us uh, get away. Uh, we were in Estes Park, Colorado this last week, and uh, we were a part of that uh, incredible snowstorm that came through. It shut down Interstate 25, 70. It shut down everything. We had to stay an extra day. That was just so terrible um, <laughs> to have to stay one more day. How many of you guys watch that show, Tiny House Living? Anybody watch that? Uh, you see it on TV? I follow this group on uh, Instagram called Van Life diaries and it's about these people that that live in vans and they've converted vans over and Danielle and I have these uh, kind of visions of grandeur and dreams of going man one of these days we could do that let me tell you what I will not do I will not do tiny house living with three kids <laughs> stayed in a room uh, king size bed fold out couch blow up mattress and it looked like something exploded in the room uh, over the last five days it was fun but I was ready to spread back out with cleanliness and organization when I got home. Anybody, anybody tracking with me? Uh, I'm just telling you. So, uh, hey, we are in this series. Uh, today we're looking at lasting fruit. Uh, I know the video said presence of the Holy Spirit. Some of you got scared and thought we we're going to do it again for an hour and a half. Um, we're not. Um, but this next two weeks that we're going to be talking about is really what inspired this whole series. Uh, these last two things, they were going to be looking at lasting fruit. Next week, Jake's going to be closing with enduring faith. And, and really, that's kind of where we started with this whole series. We started with the end. Because one of the questions we started asking months ago as an elder and, and teaching team was, are we producing people that are producing lasting fruit? Just because we gather big crowds and just because we influence a lot of people, is there really lasting fruit in there? And is there anything that's going to endure after we're gone? Because there's this whole idea that I think 
we all want to finish well. You know, we, we want to get to the end of our life and, and look at our life and go, man, I have something to show for it. In fact, I was thinking this morning that because I didn't have children until late in life, my 20s were a whole lot like some of your 60s and 70s. I kind of lived a retired life in my 20s, and, and I didn't have kids. I didn't have responsibility. I had lots of money that I, I, I know some of you are going, that's not retirement. Anyway, um, you know, I had lots of money. I had lots of resources, and I just did anything I kind of wanted to do, but I, look, I was thinking about that uh, this morning. I don't have a whole lot to show from that. That there was that period in my journey from the time I graduated and I worked and I owned my own business and I traveled and did all these things and went to college and got out of college and got married and went through all that. And, and for those about 13 years, there was no responsibility, but I don't have a whole lot to show for it. And now I'm kind of creeping up on that age and another 10 years, my house will be empty. Amen. Let me just resonate on that a minute. Um, uh, my kids will graduate, hopefully, and they'll go off to college, and we'll have an empty nest. And, and there's something in all of us that want to finish well. And part of that is that lasting fruit, that enduring faith. If you remember, this all started in John chapter 16 when Jesus came to those three words, I've told you all of this. All of what? See, Jesus has been talking about, if you go back to John chapter 12, he's talking about his death. He's talking about, hey, guys, there's coming a point where I'm going to go and I'm going to die and I'm going to be risen again. And he talked about unless a seed falls to the ground, that, that many will not be saved unless I die. But he also was given as an illustration that we must die and that when we die to ourselves and we're risen to Christ, that we begin to imitate someone and that someone is Jesus. And because we imitate Jesus, we serve like he did. We love like he did. We get along like he did. We, we literally understand what it means to love one another because that's all traits of a growing, mature disciple. And then the great statement, but God gave us the Holy Spirit. And Joe kind of touched on that last week about the Holy Spirit. And it was a hard teaching, wasn't it? It was a hard teaching because here's what Jesus basically said. I'm going to give you an advocate and that advocate is going to help you obey. Nobody likes to hear that, do they? Because Jesus, if you read in the end of John chapter 14, he said, listen, if you love me, you'll obey what I tell you to do. Oops. Because everybody kind of gets uncomfortable and we wanted the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Let's just, yeah. <laughs> but obey, really? Yeah. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we can then obey. And then we come to the end of that great talk. And Jesus picks up in John chapter 14, that very last verse. Look at it. Here's what he says. He says, come now. Let's leave. You see, I don't want you to miss that because they've been in the upper room. They've been having a meal. They've, he's washed their feet. He's, he's, he's served them. We've had Judas exit the room. And, and there's been a lot go on. And finally, Jesus comes back to this very end. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. You're going to, for the fruits of the Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, living in the Holy Spirit. And then he goes, okay, guys, you ready? Let's go. <laughs> and they leave. And you remember what's going on right now in Jesus' day is that it was a Passover meal. So everybody's come to Jerusalem. All these things are happening. There's, just, there's these festivities. There's these parties going on. And, and all these things are, are happening in the city. And Jesus said, come on, guys, let's, let's leave. And so they go out the door and, and the disciples followed him because that's what disciples do. Disciples follow Jesus. I'm going to let that set a minute. Disciples follow Jesus. Jesus said, come on, guys, let's go. And the guys got up and left, and they went out, and Jesus didn't take them into the city. Jesus took them out of the city. He took them out into the city. These 11 men, they, maybe they were carrying lamps and, and torches, and they were walking out, and, and they, they, I don't know if they knew where they were going. Jesus didn't say where they were going, but, but they went out, and they were heading towards the Mount of Olives. It's where they spent a lot of time. They were avoiding the Temple Mount. They were avoiding all the crowds. Jesus had a purpose to take these guys out and put them alone, and they walked single file, and they began to walk through these great vineyards outside the city of Jerusalem. These great vineyards were tied up. And, and so they were walking single file through these vineyards. And then all of a sudden, just outside the city walls, just before they get to the Mount of Olives, just before we get to that point where Jesus is betrayed and Jesus is arrested. And, then, and that moment in the garden where he prayed that Jesus stops. I want you to get the picture. He's in the middle of a vineyard. He's in the middle. And here all these guys are lined up. And when Jesus stopped, they're like... 
there, it's almost like there's this anticipation, like, oh, did, did he see something? And Jesus reaches over and he grabs a vine and he begins to tell this story as he holds this vine. And I'm sure this vine in this season and this time when Jesus was crucified, this vine was beginning to grow and show some fruit and show some growth in that. There's some green, there's a healthy vine and he's holding this vine. In the next few minutes, what Jesus begins to talk about was not what they were expecting to hear, but he begins with the story and I want to warn you before we jump into this story because so many people will read the, what we're about to read and they'll take it so literal. <laughs> and they'll try to figure out what it looks like. Jesus tells a story. There's some principles here I want to pull out of this. And I want you to see this in John chapter 15, verse 1. Look what he says, I am. Everybody say, I am. I am the true vine, Jesus said. And my Father is the gardener. Now we can stop right there. I'm telling you, I could spend the next hour and a half. Relax, I'm not. Okay? I could spend the next hour and a half just on those two things. I mean, look at that. I am. Over and over again, Jesus said in John 6 35, I am the bread of life. Jesus said in John 8 12, I am the light of the world. In John 10, 7 and 9, I am the door. In John 10, 11, 14, I am the good shepherd. John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and life. In John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And now in John 15, 1, I am the vine. In other words, Jesus is pointing out to us, look, man, you want to know where life is? I am. I could literally spend the next hour and a half just talking about the I am. Jesus is once again coming back and reiterating to these guys, I am. And then notice the second thing, my father, that the whole purpose of our life and the whole purpose of us being mature is so that we would grow up into a relationship with the father. Jesus says, I am. And then right after the I am, he says, my father. Is that in other words, the I am and the father are connected. Jesus is the vine. And yet the father is the vine dresser or the gardener. In other words, we can come to the conclusion that you and I grow off of that as the branches, as we're about to see. You see, the father is the gardener. He's the one that inspects the fruit. He's the one that comes along and looks at it. We're not to be fruit inspectors. Somewhere along the journey, we switched that around, didn't we? We became fruit inspectors and started looking at other people. Listen, Jesus says here that God is the fruit inspector. He inspects every branch. The essence of relationship is being in Jesus and bearing fruit is the goal of a healthy vine. In other words, what good is a vine that doesn't produce fruit? So Jesus here is looking at this. They're standing in this garden. They're standing in this vineyard. And he's saying, listen, boys, I am the vine. I am the vine. And he's holding that vine. Can you see the, the tension? Can you see the drama of standing in the middle of the night? They've just had a meal, and Jesus is having this conversation. You see, for years I was taught in John 15, verses 1 and 2, was just a, a call that our fruit is to win people to Jesus. And if you're not winning people to Jesus, you don't have any fruit. And yet I look at that passage and I go, yeah, I can see where that, would, that, that could be true. Yeah, our fruit should be us winning people to Jesus, but I don't think it's restricted just to that. I think there's so much more in this passage. I was telling someone this morning, the, the more I've marinated on this for the last two weeks, in fact, we stayed in this condo that right beside a river, and I'm looking at all these vines, I'm looking at all this stuff, and it's just been marinating in my head for the last two weeks. And I look at this, and I'm going, you know those words fruit and good works, they're almost interchangeable when you look at the Scripture. In fact, I was reading in Titus 3.14, look at it. He says this, Paul's talking to Tim and Titus, and he says, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds and to meet pressing needs so that they will not be what? What's that word? Unfruitful. You see, Paul was connecting the dots of what Jesus was fixing to teach these guys. In practical terms, our fruit represents good works. And listen, I know some of you, this is where, this is where last week was so hard. This is where last week got so difficult for so many of us because we love the whole idea of grace and God loves you. And we're going to get there this morning, so don't, 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 don't fret. But there's also this idea that God created us for good works. And those works are the fruit of who we're connected to. 
You see, there's two different kinds of fruit. There's an inner fruit and an outward fruit. That inner fruit is the qualities of Christ's likeness. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, where he talks about the fruits of the Spirit. That's not something you and I actually conjure up. It's something that is a result of the Holy Spirit being in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering. That those, it's because of the Holy Spirit being in us. Those are the natural fruit that should come out. And that outward fruit from that inner fruit or our actions, our good deeds, that's what makes Christ visible in us and to the world that all may look upon us and the fruit and what the Holy Spirit is producing in us so that the world may give God glory. So now let's keep reading. Look at verse 2. This is when it gets hard. In verse 1, he's, he's talking about the Him and the Father. And then in verse 2, he's talking about that vine dresser, talking about God that he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, there are some scholars that interpret this verse to mean that if you bear no fruit, you can't be a Christian. If you have no fruit in your life, there's no way you can be a Christian. And others will even take it further and they'll take those words, takes away or cut off, depending on what translation you're reading, to mean that if you persist and persist in your life without showing even evidence of your salvation, that you can actually lose your salvation. See, there's two different extremes in that. One, if you don't exhibit that, then you can't be a Christian. And two, if you don't, then you're going to lose your salvation. Listen, I think we can safely conclude conclude that you can be in Christ and be, yet be like a branch that produces no fruit for a time. We're going to see that in just a moment. And, and by the way, can I just say this for people who say that they're going to lose their salvation? According to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, if we say here that God's going to cut you off and you can lose your salvation, then that negates Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 that says that we are saved by faith, not by anything that we do. You follow me? So this whole idea you can lose your salvation, it, it kind of it puts it in, in, in tension with other passages. In verse 2, a clearer translation of that word cuts off would actually, if you look at that Greek word in there, it actually means to take up or lift up. In fact, you, if you look at that word found other places in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus produced uh, all those baskets of bread and all those baskets of fish, it literally the same word that he uses here in John chapter 15, he uses in Matthew 12, that they took up or they picked up 12 baskets. In Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus was carrying the cross and he fell and Simon came and picked up the cross. That same word used there in John chapter 15 is used here in Matthew when Simon picked up the cross. And then in John chapter 1 verse 29, Jesus who takes away or took upon or picked up all of our sins and put it on him. The reason Jesus came is so he can take up our sins and put on us. So when we look at the lessons from the vineyard in context of this, what he means by not cut, necessarily cut off, he means literally that branch that doesn't produce, he's going to pick up. He's going to pick up. Now, let me stop and say this to you. He's talking to those of us who have a relationship with Jesus. He's not talking to people that are not a part of the vine. He's talking about those of us who have committed our life to Jesus Christ. And so when you look at that in context of that, is that literally Jesus is coming along and saying, look, if you're not bearing fruit, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually pick you up. I was doing some studying on vineyards this last week. And I'm not, I'm not a big wine buff. I, in fact, every time we order wine or something like that, I have to go, what do I like? Because I, I, that's, that's how I'm, I don't drink wine, right? And so I don't know a whole lot about it, but I've been reading this last week. Welcome to Summit, by the way. Um, um, people are like, he, did he say he drank wine? Yeah, it's not a sin, okay? But anyway, um, I was reading some about these vineyards. And, and what they say is that when, when a, when a um, grapevine begins to grow, the new branches tend to grow towards the ground, and they'll grow along the ground. And that's why it's important for those vineyards, for those vine dressers to come along, because what happens is those new vines begin to grow, the leaves get covered in dust. And, and they become muddy and mildewed and sick and useless. If you've ever seen uh, ivies grow along the ground, the same is true with, with the grapevines. They, they have a tendency to go down. And so what they would do is, is they, they wouldn't come along and go, gosh, look at that. I'm going to cut that off because that would be a valuable vine you would lose, branch you would lose. So here's what the vineyard 
vine dresser does. They say that he'll take a bucket of water and a rag and he'll walk the vineyard rows and he'll look for those vines that are down on the ground. And when he finds that vine down on the ground, he'll get down on the ground and he'll take that water and he'll wash the leaves off. As he washes the leaves off, he then lifts the vine up and ties it to the trellis to bring it up so that it could be now cleaned and it doesn't have the mud and the mildew on it and it can be exposed to the sunlight so that it can then begin to produce. Isn't that an incredible picture? And when we read that, and sometimes the English language doesn't translate from the Greek, and we read that and we see cuts off, and everything. Like, ah! And listen, what God's saying is, I want to lift you up. Because you're still living in a world full of sin. And I'm the, the, the Father is the vine dresser. He's not going to throw it away or abandon it. He's going to lift you up, clean it off, and help you flourish again. You see, sin is the dirt that's covering many of us, and air and light gets blocked off when we're in the world doing this. And God comes along, and he's lifting us up, and he's washing us off. He's the vine dresser. So how does the vine dresser lift us from the mud and the misery? And how does he take where some of you are today, that you are a branch that's never produced fruit. And if you have produced fruit, it's been very little for a short period of time. It seems like you're always finding yourself down on the ground. It seems like you're always finding yourself covered in mud and mildew and dirt. How does the vine dresser deal with that? Let me, let me give you the first secret. You ready for this? Here's the first secret. If your life consistently bears no fruit, and you have given your life to Christ. You've surrendered your life to Jesus. Remember, I'm talking to believers here. I'm not talking about if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, it doesn't apply to you. I'm talking about for those of you that made a decision for Christ years ago, and maybe you've walked away, and you're no longer bearing fruit. Then listen, this is what God will do. God will intervene to discipline you. Why? Because he loves you. You see, last week, some of you didn't like hearing that from Joe. You didn't like doing that. You see, if necessary, God will even use painful measures to bring you to repentance. The Bible calls this process discipline. And normally God's discipline starts because of a sin problem. Not because God's some cruel God like your daddy was. Some of you have confused who your earthly father is with our heavenly father. Our heavenly father does not discipline us for the fun of it. He disciplines us so, because he loves us and he, wants, and he knows there's more in that for us. And listen, here's something you need to understand. The discipline ends when the problem ends. For some of you, you didn't grow up that way. You grew up with a dad or a spouse or someone that held that over you all your life. Listen, here's what I'm, I believe that God's saying to us. When he lifts us up and he pulls us up, the discipline ends when the problem ends. He doesn't hold it over you. He doesn't hold it over you. But he'll take necessary measures to cor correct that wayward branch. His actions are intended to nudge you nudge me lovingly and wisely and persistently. And once we understand the motive of this discipline, it's not because he's mad at us. He loves us and he's designed you and he's given you a new life so that you'll bear fruit. And so when sin's in our life and we're down on the ground and we're covered in muck, either by someone else's choice or our own choice, amen, he's gonna gently lift us up. He's gonna gently clean us up. And listen, if you're being disciplined, he wants you to get out of it even more than you want to get out of it. He wants you to produce. He doesn't expect you to seek out or, or even want his correction. No, listen to me. If you're being disciplined, he wants you out of it even more than you do. And the enemy's going to try to convince you that God's mad at you. He's not mad at you. His whole purpose is to pick you up. That's the purpose of the vine dresser, is to pick you up and so that you'll bear fruit. And the enemy would love to convince you that the Father is dealing with you in an unfair way, that you're worthless, that you're an unlikable loser, but that's not the truth. The vine dresser only wants you to produce. Let's keep reading. I love John 15, 3. He says, you are already clean. You remember? This is the second time he's coming back to this. And when he, when he washed the disciples' feet, he said, listen, you don't need a whole bath. You're already clean. He's coming back to this analogy. Because of the word I've spoken to you, you are already clean. Remain in me and I also will remain in you. Because no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. 
but apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers, and such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, let me stop right here because some of you are going, yeah, but what about that? Can you lose your salvation? Look at it. Verse four, Jesus is saying that we are chosen. Do you see what he says? You've already cleaned. Remain in me as, also as I also remain in you. In other words, here's what he's saying. I'm committed to remaining in you. If, if I have saved you, I'm not going anywhere. Do you understand that? You weren't saved by anything you did in the first place. And now Jesus is just saying, look, man, I, you are clean. I chose you, and I'm not going anywhere. I'm a part of you now. You're a part of me now. Verse 4, he's teaching the disciples and us that we were created to bear fruit, lasting fruit. We were created to bear fruit. Isn't that good? In verse 5, he's showing us that the vine and him that we will bear, we can't bear fruit apart from abiding in him. The only way we can bear fruit is if we are abiding in the vine. Verse 6, he's saying that you, you can be like. Everybody say be like. You can be like a dead branch if you want to be. But you're going to wither. You're going to fade away. That doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation. But if you want to be like a dead branch, go ahead. But listen, God disciplines those he loves. And the opposite is true. If you don't have any discipline in your life, Hebrews 12, verse 8, says we're not true sons and daughters of God. So discipline is a good thing, amen? I remember growing up, my friend, I'm not going to mention his name because he watches us every once in a while. But I remember we were riding bicycles one time, and me and another buddy were griping about our parents disciplining us. And I remember him stopping and looking at us going, guys, at least they love you enough to tell you no. We were in sixth grade. He said, I just wish my parents would say no every once in a while. You see, there's something about being loved that brings discipline. Now, at the time, discipline's not fun, is it? We don't like it. <laughs> and it may be a small rebuke, just that prick of our conscience. You see, God will take a timely word, maybe something you read on Twitter or Facebook, maybe a sermon like today, maybe a friend that comes along and speaks a word, Conviction of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's just that simple rebuke that, that turns us back to him. Amen? But if that doesn't work, let me tell you what God will do, and he's not afraid to do that. He's not afraid to come along and chastise us, is he? Right? You ever done that with your, your own children? Yeah. Something you feel emotional anxiety and frustration and stress. Remember that thing that used to give you joy that doesn't give you joy anymore? Pressure at work, at home, finances. Some of you used to be fulfilled at church and now all of a sudden you're critical of me and the guy you're sitting by and the, the spouse you're sitting by or the person in front of you or behind you and, and all of a sudden now what used to give you all this great joy is sadness and lethargy and when you used to pick the scripture up you couldn't wait and now you, you, you just kind of dread it or don't do it at all. You see, if those symptoms are familiar, you might need to look for some sin in your life because there might be something going on that God's trying to get your attention. I know for me, I, I, it's so easy for me to get there. It's so easy for me to, the things that used to bring me joy, and, and all of a sudden I'll get frustrated or I'll get prideful or, or I'll think Edward something, amen? And all of a sudden it's no longer joy. And that's when God begins to reveal to me there's sin in the camp, Ed. There's sin in the camp. See, even then if we don't respond, Joe said this last week, and I think this is where some took issue, that if we won't respond for rebuke, we won't respond out of that low-grade fever, then God will spank us. And see, we don't like to hear that, do we? We don't like to hear the spanking part. And I'm telling you, as a parent, I get it, because I don't really like spanking my kids. In fact, sometimes I'll little give it away with something they shouldn't, because I struggle and maybe as a younger dad, I wouldn't struggle as much as I do as an older dad. But I just don't like whipping my kids. And when I do, I'll, I'll spend hours. And may, maybe you'll help me, some of you older dads. Maybe you can come to me and say, it's okay. But I remember the, there's been several times where I've spanked my kids and I'll lay in bed at night and just beat myself up. But again, I know it's for the good. 
You see, God won't bless sin. He'll deal with it. And you'll either become the illustration of the glorification of the Son. You'll either become an illustration of what not to do, or if you'll go ahead and deal with the sin that God has in your life, and that, you, that you have in your life, then you'll become the glory of his Son. See, look what the, this passage in, in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty 30 says. It's so true. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number are asleep. See, here's what he's talking about. Paul's talking about in the church, that it's possible that you can be weak, you can be sick. You can be on the ground covered in dust and mildew and dirt and all the stuff. And the reason that you're there, can I just tell you that? It's because you haven't judged yourself rightly. Listen, and what he's saying is, is look at your life. If there's sin in your life, then judge yourself. Because look at the next line. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we'll not be condemned along with the world. In other words, here's what he's saying. Look, deal with your sin and you can become the glory of my son. If not, you're going to become the illustration of what not to do. You're going to become the illustration of what not to do. Don't get down on the ground. I mean, if a vine was real and, and, and could talk, Jesus would say, look, see that vine down there? Don't act like him. He, that, he ain't growing. That's really what he's saying to us. So it's the secret of the vine. Number one is if your life constantly bears no fruit, God's going to intervene. And number two, here's the good news. If your life bears some fruit, God's going to intervene to prune you. And this purpose is, is so that he can cut away those immature growth. You got any immaturity in your life? You see, left to itself, this is so interesting. It's so interesting. It has so much parallel to the church. Left to the self, a, a, a vine, a grapevine will produce incredible greenery. It will explode in green. It's amazing. <laughs> Lots of green doesn't mean fruit. That has several applications, okay? Just because you're rich doesn't mean you're smart. Amen? Yeah, I'm, okay, let me walk away from that. Left to itself, a grape plant will always favor new growth over more grapes. Lots of green doesn't mean fruit. It doesn't. Grapevines can become so dense that the sun can't reach deep into the areas where the fruit forms. That's why the vine dresser comes along and cuts away vigorously those young, immature shoots so that the sunlight can get down to where the fruit is because a vineyard's only purpose is fruit. Let me say that again. A vineyard's only purpose is fruit. A Christian's only purpose in maturity is fruit of the Holy Spirit. You see that where he's coming there? Again, two kinds of fruit, inner fruit and outer fruit. For many of us, this growth that we have represents those preoccupations, those priorities in our lives, some of those things that, that keep us away from the things we know God wants us to do. And so what God's going to come in there is because you begin to grow and you begin to show some growth. And he's going to come in there and he's going to take those shears and he's going to start pruning away. Because without pruning, we're only going to live up to a fraction of what God wants us to do. You still may produce some, some, some grapes, but there's so much more that God wants by pruning into that and cutting away some of that, cutting away those smaller ones so that, so that the, 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 the energy they're taking can be put into the healthiness of producing fruit. We all know this to be true. You see, early pruning is about outward activities, priorities, but it's those deeper things that when God starts seeing you grow, he's going to start moving into those deeper things, that deeper moment so that that fruit can be produced. I remember I had a good friend of mine that, that started a vineyard here locally. And before he came to our church, I'd run into him every once in a while. I'd say, how's the vines, man? You got any wine yet? And he's like, no. It's like, dude, this went on five years. I remember I ran into him at the Chevron one day. We were getting gas. I said, okay, bro. You've had a vineyard for five years. Where's the wine? He goes, well, we're about another four years away. I said, like, really? He said, yeah. He said this. He said, a grapevine to produce the sweetest grapes need to suffer. He said, so I'm suffering the vine right now. I was like, huh? <laughs> that didn't make sense to me. We were in a drought at that point. Y'all remember the drought several years ago? And I was like, well, what about this drought? He goes, oh, the drought's the best thing for the vines because it's suffering. 
and it's making their roots grow deep. And so I'm going to keep the growth down until the roots are ready and it's suffered enough. And then I'm going to let it grow. And I'm going to prune it so I can produce the sweetest grapes. I find that interesting that God moves in close to us for pruning. In fact, in verse 7 of John 15, it says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. It will be done for you. Because this is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit. Now think about that. Why would God chastise? Why would God prune? Why would God come along this way? Why? Because he wants you to bear much fruit. Showing ourselves that we're followers of Jesus Christ by bearing much fruit. The reason he prunes is to bear fruit. That's why God's always pruning those things that we savagely seek first. That we love the most. He's going after those things that we're, we're going, no, I don't want to let go. Because he's driving that principle home, seek first the kingdom of God. And listen, all these things will be added unto you. So God's going to come in and he's going to prune that. It's more than rearranging priorities. It's going to who we are. We're a branch connected to the vine. Here's the third secret of the vine. Number one, if your life consistently bears no fruit, God's going to intervene. Number two, if your life bears some fruit, he's going to intervene to prune you. But here's the third thing, and I love this. If your life bears a lot of fruit, God's going to invite you to abide more deeply. That the more we produce, the more he's inviting us to abide. John 15, 7 says again, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. In other words, come on. Come on. That's so good. It'll be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Listen, that word to abide means to remain, to stay closely connected. Now, don't miss this because it's so important because that word abide is an imperative. It's not a suggestion or a request. It's a command. You know why Jesus commanded things? Because the things that he commanded does not come naturally. So it's an imperative in the passage here. In the seasons of discipline and pruning, it's God doing the pursuing. And then all of a sudden, we see a shift of where God pursued, God initiated, that our role was just to respond. All of a sudden, Jesus says, oh, by the way, guys, this is, what's, this is why I want you to do this. This is what's going to happen because I want you now a 180-degree shift that when you begin to produce, I want you to abide. Stay there restored there, be fruitful at the highest level. You see, to abide, we have to act. The great majority of us today are ignorant of that promise and that command of abiding because abiding is about the most important friendship. It's not about how much Bible you know or how much faith you have. In abiding, listen to this, in abiding, you seek, you long for, you thirst for, you wait for, see, know, love, hear, spend resources on, and respond to a person. Now, I need to say that again. In abiding, you seek, long for, thirst for, wait for, see, know, love, hear, spend resources on, and respond to a person, Jesus to abide. More abiding means more of God in our activities and our thoughts and our desires. In our Western culture, we're such in a rush to do and to be when God's inviting us just to abide. I was reading this last week in 1 Chronicles 4. It's a passage that we're familiar with and I want to close with this and say a couple things to you. In 1 Chronicles 4, verse 9 and 10, it says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. How would you like that legacy? Mama named you because you're a pain. Amen? Now, some of you want to rename your kids, I know. It's interesting, Jabez was more honorable. So Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me. And enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I'll be free from pain. Probably the most self-centered prayer I've ever read. Anybody with me? I know you didn't expect me to say that, did you? Some of you are like, oh, oh, I read that book, Prayer for J. Bales. You know what the most astonishing statement of that whole passage is? And God granted 
his request. There's something about abiding. There's something there that that Jabez prayer invites God to use us to bear fruit. You see, the secret of the vine reveals how God changes us so that we become more useful and fruitful for his glory. Oh God, that you would bless me. You'd expand my territory. That we would unlock change in our lives when we finally just learn to abide in who we already are and God's already put in us and the Holy Spirit and we press in, give to, long for, can't wait to see, can't wait to spend time with. Kind of like that girlfriend you had that you married and now called your wife. Come on. Let me close by saying this. If you're in a season of discipline, I want to say to you, the vine dresser is kneeling beside you. And he's looking to wash your leaves off. And he's inviting you to produce. He's not mad at you. He's not disgusted at you. He's not even irritated at you. He just wants to pick you up and tie you up. He didn't see a chronic loser or a failure. He's here to wash you off. You're already clean. You're already part of the vine. He's just wanting to pick you up and tie you up. Listen, if you're in a season of pruning, he's not unhappy with you. He's far from it. I remember the first rose bush I planted 25 years ago. I lived on 41st Street in Sand Springs, Oklahoma. I planted it right by my front porch. And I bought it, and it was only that tall. Within one year, that sucker was about yay big. And I read everything I could read about pruning and all that. And I would go out there and you could only have a certain number of buds on the plant in order to produce the largest. And I can remember going and I was like, oh, it's growing. And then I got so excited because then I got to start pruning it. I wasn't mad at that rose bush. I had a vision of what I wanted that rose bush to look like. God has a vision. If you're in a pruning right now, yeah, those shears look big. Yeah, it's, oh, no, not that one, God. He's not mad at you. He got a vision for you to produce more. And listen, if you're in a season of abiding, I just want you to envision God leaning back. Because I can remember looking at that rose bush. I would sometimes drive up in my little rent house there where I planted that rose bush. And I'd sometimes sit in the truck and I'd just stare at it. And if it had been a person, I'd have got out and said, man, you look good. In fact, Danielle gets mad at me every time I post a picture of her on my Instagram. Instagram for me is guns, fish, animals, and my wife. Amen? That's my Instagram. And she'll get mad at me every once in a while. And she, I'll say this in second service, she'll get mad at me again. Because I posted a selfie of her on my Instagram this last week in Colorado. And she said, why did you post that? That was just for you and you only. I said, because you're mine. And there's something about leaning back and admiring that which is healthy. So if you're producing right now, understand God's so pleased. But don't get prideful, okay? Because we do have a grape robber, amen? And he can create doubt and distrust, discouragement, and the enemy's going to try to steal the harvest. So be aware. Don't get prideful in that. You see, God can use you no matter what season of life you're in, no matter what's going on. And his plans for you are unique. And it's never too late to begin bearing fruit. And I know some of you are sitting in this room going, yeah, but Ed, I'm on this end of my life. I don't have a lot to offer. This last week I was reading about the oldest vine in the world. It holds the Guinness World Record. Somewhere in the 17th century, this grape vine was planted. And it's, it's over in Slovenia, uh, just outside of uh, the Baltic states in Austria. It's over 400 years old. This vine still produces today. It's the oldest vine, continues to grow. And even through all the invasions and all the wars and all the fires and, and all that's happened, despite all of this, this grapevine has continued to live. Isn't that amazing? And, and what's unique about it is, is that it's, despite this grapevine being 400 years old, it only produces 120 pounds of fresh grapes annually. It's not much. In fact, it only produces about 6.6 gallons of wine. That's it. 
a 400-year-old vine, only 6.6 gallons of wine. Some of you had that over the last two weeks, amen? Okay, it's not confession, all right, I get it. In fact, it, it became uh, known as, as this... Um, <coughs> reputation that it couldn't be killed. And there, there's this one particular parasite that is devastating to wine, to, to vines. And this parasite landed in this region and killed most of the vines in this region. This vine survived. It was in the 1870s, a pandemic. And it didn't affect this old vine. And here's what they found out. The reason it did not infect this old vine is because this vine's roots were embedded into the banks of the Drava River. And in the banks of the Drava River, because those roots had gone so deep, the parasite could no longer live where the roots of the vine were. <laughs> so I was reading this last week and looking at that, I was going, that's Psalms 1. Listen to this, look at it. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, abiding. And his law, he meditates day and night, abiding. That a person, that person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. That's maturity. Yeah, we still live in a world of sin, but when our roots are into the living waters of Jesus Christ, the parasite of sin can no longer live. Let your roots grow deep. See, this whole deal of us starting this series is we want your roots to grow deep. We don't want to. Listen, we love greenery. Can I just say that? I, I, I love greenery. In fact, I love growing ivies because you, if you can't grow an ivy, something's wrong with you. Amen? And some of you are like, I, I'm, I'm that one guy. I can't grow an ivy. Listen, I can set ivies out and I can grow ivies and I just love to see it overtake everything. But there's something about fruit. God, he's not impressed with a bunch of greenery. He designed us for fruit. He designed us for fruit. You know that wine of only 6.6 .6 U.S. gallons of wine get produced on a yearly basis out of that vine in Sylvania? It's never sold. It is so valuable, it's only given to foreign dignitaries that visit their country. I was thinking about that since last week. That you and I are the grapes, the fruit, that fine wine that God has made to put on display, to be stood back and looked. Oh, man, that's expensive. Man, that's good. You see... Part of maturity is growing up and producing lasting fruit, but your roots have got to go deep and you got to abide. And when your roots are deep, the parasites can't live. Some of us are sick and weak and we need to be picked up. And others of us, we're just producing like crazy. Amen. And God's pruning. Pruning is never fun, but don't give up. You may think you don't have much to offer. 6.6 .6 gallons of wine is the most expensive wine in the world. In fact, it's priceless. You can't buy it. You don't have enough money to buy it. And that's what God says about us because of Jesus. Let your roots grow deep. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that you don't leave us like we are. May you continue to prune us that we may produce. God, I pray for that one today that's just on the ground. They're covered in dust and mildew and mud and junk. God, I pray you'd wash them off, tie them up, prune us that we may produce fruit that lasts for your kingdom that people may believe on the name of Jesus Christ. And we ask it in his beautiful name. And everybody said, amen. I love you. Have a great week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize. 
to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.